Hello, a very good morning, and you're welcome to uh, today's Signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson, and uh, we're joining you today from a rather overcast uh, Galway, uh, but we do hope you're keeping safe and well. This series is brought to you by Chagisk in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland and the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And today we'll be discussing how catchment scientists and agricultural advisors are working collaboratively with the farming community to improve local water quality. The Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advice Programme, also known as ASAP, is a programme designed to work in partnership with farmers to address pressures from agriculture. And we're delighted to be joined by Philip Murphy, who's a catchment scientist with Law Pro, and Cahill Summers, who's agricultural advisor with the ASAP programme. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Mark, how are you keeping? Great, very, very well today. And good morning to you, Pat. How are you today? Great, not a bother. Great, great. Well, you're all very welcome. Uh, Philip, if I could start with you and maybe if you could tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing with Law Pro. I know you're going to go into detail within the presentation, but uh, maybe just give us an overview of, of uh, what the purpose of Law Pro is and your role there. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, we're really based in the, in the, at the river level across the whole country. We're divided into separate teams across the country and we evaluate, we carry out environmental assessments in our rivers to determine the, the health status of them. From there, then we can determine whether measures are needed to improve water quality in an area that maybe uh, water quality is under a threat. And we do that. We work with a lot of different agencies across the country and we're, we work with a lot of local authorities in that as well. So we're, we're fairly widespread. Brilliant. So, so your your role really is to 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 develop the profile of, of a catchment or a water body, uh, so that we can understand maybe where the pressures are coming from. Is that right? That's it. Yeah, the catchment scale we start off with, and then we work down to the river, get onto the, the ground, boots in the water, as they say. Right, great. And Carl, if I could turn to you, could you tell us about the work that you're doing? You're you're very much uh, the, the the face uh, of the program with the farmers. Is that correct? That's a scary thought, all right, Mark. But yeah, we are. Look, where I suppose what we do is I work very closely with Philip. Uh, Philip provides the science, and we provide the advice. And what I do is when I hit go onto a farm, I work with the farm, and we try and look at look and come up with solutions how to reduce, I suppose, impacts in the river from the farm. So it's a, it, everyone's fairly familiar with ASAP at the moment. It's a free, confidential, voluntary service to farmers in priority areas for action. I cover Waterford is my region, and I'm, I have about probably seven to eight different priority areas for action selected down there that I work closely with farmers in that area. I also support local advisors as well and any water quality issues, that kind of stuff. So busy job, but um, great job. Great to meet farmers, uh, getting on really well. Uh, and I think the service really going on well with people. So it's, it's excellent so far. I was just going to ask you, how, how are farmers responding to that, that, that service or that uh, advice that you're providing to them? Yeah, look, initially, I suppose the first year that we started, Obviously, people would have been a bit slow coming in. Who, who's this fella coming in looking to assess for water? Didn't really fully understand the service. But as we've grown over time and people got to know us, um, you know, it's been hugely positive. Uh, it's gone from a position where we were looking for people to visit their farms, ringing them, whereas they're starting to ring us looking for our help. So that's exactly where we want to be. Uh, very, very positive. The engagement is massive. So I think it's, it's a huge success to date. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, we have two separate presentations from uh, Philip and, and Cahill. Philip, you're going to start uh, proceedings this morning. So if I could ask you to, to share your screen with us. Um, and just remind everybody, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, on the, our YouTube channel and also available as a podcast. And you can pick the slides up as well on the Chagas website. So Philip, we'll hand over to you and uh, we will talk to you afterwards. Thanks a million, Mark. So, um... The presentation is split, so I'll give the first half here. Um, I'm Philip Murphy, I'm with Law Pro, the Local Authority Waters Programme. It's a, a national shared service working on behalf of all local authorities in Ireland. The aim is to coordinate efforts to achieve good or high water quality status across our rivers, uh, our lakes, coastal waters, and groundwater, which is a requirement of the, the EU Water Framework Directive. Altogether, there are about 36 scientists and 13 community officers uh, working in these priority areas for action, which I'll get into in a minute. We're nationally focused, but we're, we're also regionally based. We have updates on our priority areas for action, and they're available on our website. And as information comes in and, and updates that we can provide, they'll be available on that website. 
it's important as opposed to just mention like I'll be explaining this process from desk study down to referrals and each step of the way from my perspective, but Cahill will be, you know, Cahill works in parallel with me in a lot of cases where, where we have agricultural issues, say. And so this is an example of these two pictures here. I was invited to a farmer discussion group there. I'm talking there from the stream side on the left and Cahill and um, Andrew Garrity there from uh, Glanvia talks to, to the farmers at the discussion group. So there's plenty of collaboration there along the way. Um, and I'll explain that as we go. So the role of a catchment scientist is to constantly target, get more targeted so that we're using our time and resources and as, as effectively as possible. There's 190 areas of action across the country. About 40 of three, 43 of these are in the Southeast region where I'm based and about 160 water bodies within that. A water body is in, for us is, is typically a subsection of a river as opposed to a whole river or water body itself. We work as part of a team, uh, one catchment manager, six scientists and at least two community officers in, in the area. And there are, there are four main stages to our role. Um, the desk study, which I'll go through, is, is our first uh, effort to get more targeted on the information um, that's available to us to improve water quality in an area, our public meetings, and then our, our field work and our referrals. Our public meetings are typically held in a, in a community hall like this. Uh, the community water officers will, uh, arrange to have as many members of the public are in relation to or within a catchment to come along, and we explain our program. The farmer, the farmer discussion group are held by ASAP and we'll be invited along to maybe do a demonstration of a kick sample. Our field work then, we gather information at specific sites along the way at monitoring points and subsections of a river. And I'll get into that. Um, and finally, our referrals are our way of commuting the results that we find in a river to the relevant agencies. So that desk study stage, most of our information is gathered from the EPA. We'll look at the ecological status over time. That ranges from high um, all the way down to bad, and we'll see how it's changed over time. We we'll look at monitoring data, typically nutrients that we look at are ammonia, phosphate, and nitrate, but there's other hydro hydrochemistry data available as well. And we look at the pressures in an area. So the pressures relate to what are, are the main land use types that are, could be causing a problem. Um, the agriculture as an example, urban wastewater, or in some cases that might actually be unknown what the pressure in the catchment is. Where relevant, then we can get information from inland fisheries or Quilcha, Forest Service, Irish Water and local authorities. So now I'm going to jump into one specific catchment that we're working on, the Claudia, and I'll go through the water quantity results and pressures first. So this catchment is in North County Waterford. Um, this is typically the view that we'll, we'll start with when we, when we look at our catchment. This is a, a 37 kilometre stretch of uh, water body that um, we try to narrow down as best we can. So this is our boundary of the catchment. The river flows from left to right here, and we have two monitoring points. And it's from there that we start our, I suppose, our initial assessment before we get out on, onto the ground. We'll see for this monitoring point in the middle of the catchment, there's been a, a change in status a number of times over, over the last number of years. Uh, getting down, you know, it falls down to moderate here in 2014, 2008, and 2019. And, and it's also improved up to high in 2018. So we need to figure out why that's been dropping and, and why we need and figure out ways to improve it so that it stays at good or high status. So that's our first, I suppose, point of information that we we'll gather about this catchment. The second monitoring point has had a slightly uh, more stable uh, status over time, remaining at good and high uh, with the last number of years. So we need to find out ways to protect it and make sure it stays at that um, level. The next thing we look at is our, our chemistry results. I'm going to start here with the ammonia results. The yellow dots are just the average values in a year, and the blue are just the single dots taken. So typically, the ammonia levels are below our threshold for our ammonia um, significant levels. So this wasn't considered an issue in the water body. The ammonia levels are just too low. Similarly, phosphate, although in one year that was above our threshold level here, this red line, uh, it may have been due to this outlier that occurred. But generally, uh, phosphate was below our threshold again for a significant issue in the water body. We look at nitrogen levels then. Um, it doesn't breach the threshold here, our, our red line, um, but it's tip, you know, it's, it's, it's elevated as we consider it, but not yet a significant issue. So it's something that we keep uh, in our minds when we are out in the catchment. Um, the next thing we look at, so we looked at our chemistry and our ecological status, we look at the pressures in the, the catchment. The pressures are, are typically related to the, the land use in an area. In this map here, it's the same catchment. The blue represents the agricultural area. Yellow here is arable, and we forest and peatland as well. So this shows us the distribution of land use or pressures. And so we need to consider those when we are out carrying out our assessments in the river. 
The risks we associate with those pressures are uh, for agriculture and forestry are likely to be nutrient loss. It could be point or diffuse or sediment loss could be from soil loss and erosion and hydromorphology, which may be changes to the riverbed or riverbanks. So at this stage, we're still within the desk study. We've collected a lot of information to help us, uh, I suppose, identify pressures that could be possible once we get down onto the ground. An important step we do, is it, we carry out is the pathway analysis, and there's three main pathways that we look at. An overland flow pathway is where nutrients may, or pollutants may run off the top um, of our soil and enter our river almost directly, and it's typically the shortest route for pollutants to, pollutants provided they're present, uh, to enter a waterway. The second pathway is a subsurface or shallow um, subsurface flow, where some percolation may occur through the soil, but it meets uh, an aquifer or a bedrock that acts as a barrier. And so the pathway in this case is, is a subsurface underneath the soil initially, and then it enters the water body where it meets the aquifer. And finally, there's a, a subsurface or deep flow, which enters uh, we may have a well-drained soil with a permeable subsoil and also a, a, an aquifer that has good storage, which would typically be the longest pathway that enters, I suppose, groundwater first before it comes up as surface water here. In our assessment, we determined the shallow subsurface flow was the main pathway in the Claudia, and I'll show you that in a second. Of course, there's plenty of exceptions. There's karst and limestone areas. We can have a lot of variation in our bedrock and a variation in our soil types. This is a soil type map for um, the Claudia catchment with the green showing our well-drained soils and the brown showing our, our poorly drained soils. Uh, we can expect the pathway to be overland on our, on our uh, uh, poorly drained soils and in the well-drained soils we need to consider what's underneath. In this case the aquifer is, all of these aquifers are for poor storage so they act as a barrier to any rainfall that percolates down. So nutrients can go through a subsurface or a shallow subsurface flow and enter a water body that way. So at that stage, we've equipped ourselves with a lot of information to head out onto, the, out, out, out onto the ground and start carrying out our environmental assessments on site. I'll stick to this scale for, for showing this. Um, we have two monitoring points, which we typically visit first, but we, we always try and narrow down our full stretch of water body as much as we can. So we ended up with 11 separate sites that we visited multiple times and at during different seasons. This was actually narrowed down to another five sites and um, there was evidence of impact on site that I thought was worth following up. And that's where Cahill comes in, in terms of the evidence that I find of an impact. If they're agriculturally related, I'll hand, I'll hand those over to Cahill. So these sites then, we have we've the first three here um, showing nutrient issues, which I'll explain how I got to that. And we have two separate sediment issues here in the middle of the catchment as well. <clears throat> this first uh, nutrient issue. So on site then, we carry out a, a kick sample to look at the biology in the river and see what sensitive species or pollution tolerant species are present. In this case, the, the biology was actually it was in good status, so there was a good balance there. The environmental indicators, however, showed that there was low oxygen levels which impact the biology. This was later backed up by a kick sample by the EPA themselves at the monitoring station, which found elevated oxygen levels. So that fluctuation in oxygen levels would typically indicate that there's some unnatural levels of uh, macrophytes or, or vegetation present in the, in the water body. In this case, it was quite obvious at this site that there was this widespread filamentous algae uh, on, the, on the riverbed, which would indicate that there was some kind of pollution entering, and nutrient pollution in particular, that lets these plants grow. And so it was determined that there was evidence of impact at that site. It was a similar story at our next two sites. We looked at biology again, although at the tributary side, there was an absence of stonefly, which are, are um, pollution uh, sensitive. So that was our first indicator. The DO again was also slightly low, and uh, there's also this uh, filamentous algae was present again. When we look at the tributary a bit more specifically, we see that there's some algae growth uh, occurring as well, which again is a, is a nutrient fed uh, indicator. So these, these plant life would have um, indicated that there was, there was enough evidence of impact there. Um, so that would have led to our first three referrals for ASAP because of the pressures in this area, the catchment were all agriculture related. There was no additional pressures. So, Cahill would have been with me on each of those fieldwork steps. We would have talked through it. He would have saw the, the evidence as well. <clears throat> and he's happy to accept that those are, are agriculture related referrals for those points in the river. And so I passed those on. The next two issues then, uh, the ecology in terms of uh, downstream of this sediment issue was actually impacted. And we saw that that monitoring station actually drops down to moderate kind of regularly. The environmental indicators were okay at that site. 
but the, the statement issue was, was, I suppose, obvious on the day that we were out. It was a point source that was coming from a road drain and that was pouring in sediment on this side. We know that, um, you know, it wouldn't, we wouldn't expect it to wipe out the whole river in terms of its quality, but it's, we expect it to contribute to the pressure on these invertebrates here. Uh, this was actually this road drain, which we typically see just at a, a kind of an unnatural level of sediment coming in. When you follow that up, it was actually coming from a farm laneway um, not too far away. And so that was our source and Cahill would have been, I would have passed that on to Cahill for him to deal with when, it, when it's determined as an agricultural issue. Our next sediment issue then was slightly different and it was on a different channel, um, an opposite channel, and it's more widespread than that point source that I showed you. Uh, it's interstitial sediment, uh, sedimentation, I suppose. It's going to be widespread like this. Again, this, is, this kind of sediment issue is going to affect our invertebrates, our, our bug life here, and affect the quality of the water overall. So those were our next two referrals. As I said, forestry was a pressure on this catchment as well, but I was happy to rule this out. Kyle asked me about it, what, what those pressures were. I didn't find that there was uh, any felling events related to forestry that could have linked up the sediment issues that I found. So I was happy to rule it out and Kyle was happy to accept them as an agricultural issue. So that's a total of five, five referrals and that's where I'll, I'll hand these on as a report. You know, there'll be nothing new to Kyle when I explain this to him. And so as I, um, once I've, once I've my side of the uh, role completed, Kyle, you can take over then. And this is where I hand over my presentation now as well. Okay, thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, really logical uh, process there. So I'm, I'm very clear that you're working as a team with Kyle. So uh, Kyle, if you could just share your screen with us there. Yep, that'll work. That's perfect. Okay, good to go. Excellent. Lovely. Thanks for that, Philip. Um, okay, so Philip has gone through a good bit of the process, which is so far. So he, I suppose he's talked a lot about how we work together and we work together a lot. We're in contact quite regularly because I think that cross communication is really important so that Philip can understand where the farmer side are coming from and where I can understand where the environmental issues are arising. So we can we can pass that message on. So it's a good line of communication. But I suppose it's important to emphasize before I get into it um, that the service is confidential. So for any farmers that are watching, when we discuss something, it doesn't go beyond the farm gate. So it's between me and the farmer. But I can use the knowledge I have beyond that to work on the problem. So that's important to remember. So just before I get into it, I want to, I want to say, as I suppose, uh, as I, I suggest, I work in Waterford. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the catchment. This is here a catchment scientist in the river. And this is actually TJ Phelan from Glombia with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, where he's just, they're working together on a catch and walk. But um, the main thing to remember here, this today I'm going to talk about Claudia PA. I'm going to mainly talk about sediment because that's the issue mainly identified by Philip. But bear in mind, Philip did note uh, a little bit about nitrogen. It's not an issue yet, but this, there's patches of this that is, can be quite intensive. So that's in the back of my mind. So sometimes I advise on that as well, but number one is sediment in this area. So there's a mixture between cattle, sheep, cows, a little bit of tillage, not very much, but that's, that's what we're dealing with. Just want to give a nod to our collaborators and funders. Um, there's a, this is a huge collaboration. It hasn't really been done before in, 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 in any real country. So it's working very well where we're all working together to the same goal. And I just want to, to, to let people know that, that there, there's a lot in it. We are the boots on the ground. We're the asset advisors with, with uh, the Dairy Co-op advisors and the Chagas advisors, and also then the, the local authority uh, catchment scientists as well. Um, but I, I also want to give a little nod to the farm orgs because they've been very supportive and helpful in, in getting us on farms and getting farmers involved. Also private planners as well. Uh, the EPA have done a lot with as well. And I, I don't want to forget that the local Chagas advisors have been uh, very influential in helping us get onto farms and get the word of asset out there. So just a quick run through this, I suppose, the first point of contact that I would have with Philip when we're talking about a priority area for action is the, what we would call the desktop study. And I'm not going to go into it because Philip is touching already. But inside this desktop study, it's before he ever walks onto the land um, and does a catchment walk, he, he'll analyze the data. And we go through this in fine detail so that I have a good idea of what's going on in the catchment, what the pressures were. You can see it's top over the time, what the pressures were. He'll show me the monitoring points. We look at the topography, all the influences that he thinks at that point might be a problem. And as Philip always says, he has to untangle what the issues are. And we work together on that. 
So after we, we look at those desktop studies and we go through it in detail, we normally have a community meeting in a local area. So this is just a picture. This one is actually from Dungarvan, but we have, this is where ASAP advisors always support the, the law pro community meetings. They're the ones that organize community meetings, invite everyone to the community meeting and tell them what's going on on the ground. Uh, then later on, after the community meeting, we'll do a catchment walk, say with Philip. Uh, this is actually in, in one of the, the areas that, that myself and Philip walked and initially we found. They're just looking at a tray from a kick sample. So as we're walking around the catchment, it just gives me a good feel for what's going on in the area. And I suppose Philip can talk through what's going on in his mind at the time. And we can develop a bit of a picture before we actually get into the proper analysis and farm visit at, at that stage. So also. Just before I talked about farmers meetings, you have to remember this, this is a new collaboration for three years in now, but initially we weren't used to working together in such close communication. So it, it, there, was, there is a bit of a time, I suppose, we had to develop trust amongst each other, build a relationship, and that's grown really strong. And, and I suppose myself and Philip have worked together a lot over the last couple of years, and, and it can be seen we work quite well together and that, that trust has been built up over time. So next up after the community meeting, we always host what's called a farmers meeting. And this one is slightly different from the community meeting. All the farmers in the area are invited specifically just to the, to the farmers meeting. In the Claudia, there's about 54 farmers in the area. Now, not all those farmers are farming. Some of those farmers have land rented uh, and that kind of stuff. So uh, at this meeting, we probably had about 25 to 30 farmers. Um, really good visit. So you can see here that I'm just chatting to farmers about some of the issues in the area. Philip's doing a kick sample down the river. This is actually a big cattle access point. Um, and then I'm chatting after about maybe uh, how we can avoid, how we can fix these type of issues and just giving general information. You can see this was uh, before COVID, we had the tea, that, that kind of thing is gone now, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully it'll be back at some stage. But I think it's important that um, at an early stage that, that the farmers kind of get to meet Philip because they actually love to see the kick samples. They're really interested in kick sampling. They want to see the macroinvertebrates in the river and they want to see how they're impacted. And I think it gives a very clear message to, to certainly to me when I saw it first and to farmers that, you know, if, if there's an impact on the river, it is, it, you might, it, it is impacting the river. And it's very clear when Philip throws up the trays and explains to farmers, you know, these, these uh, species are, are tolerant to pollution where these ones are not. And that's why we're not seeing them in a the river. And that's why there's an impact. So it, it's a very good message and farmers understand it and, and really enjoy that process actually. Okay, so once we have the farmers meeting done, I suppose that's a point of contact for me as well to meet a lot of local farmers and explain what the service is about and a little bit take the fear out of it because we're, we're not inspectors, we're advisors, we're there to help farmers and, and, and try and make a positive impact. And I just want to emphasize on their local area. Sometimes when we talk of regulation or we talk about water quality, it's often that we think of it as at a national level and when, it's, when you think of it as a national level and not on your own doorstep, it, it, it seems to be far away from you. It doesn't affect you. But when you bring it back to a local catchment area, you throw up the map on the wall and people can pick out where their own farm is on it. Then it brings it back to a local area. And you can actually explain to the farmers that the steps that you take will actually impact the water quality, either positively or negatively. So it's a really good point to make and it br brings it home. So I think it's important. So when we get out in the ground and you can see me here, it's just a couple of uh, pictures of me out visiting farmers. So as you've heard of us before, we generally talk about nutrient management planning, we talk about farmyards, we talk about farm land management, but because this is a sediment issue and I'm gonna show you some, some examples soon, I mainly concentrated on sediment issues. So I'll show you pictures in a minute. But on the farm visits, as I suggested earlier, we have to build trust because a lot of these farmers uh, wouldn't have met me before and they're not sure what's going on. And over the years, I suppose people always talked about water quality and regulation. Now we're gone to a different approach where, yes, we have to have the regulation. We have to ensure we're compliant, but we need to go a little step further as well because the regulation alone is not strong enough. So I suppose it's me getting onto the farms, helping the farmers out, talking to them, not just preaching at them and telling them there's an issue here, there and everywhere, but actually explain to them why there's an issue there. And farmers uh, really relate to that and understand that once they understand why there's an issue, then it's easier to fix it. The other thing, I just have this picture here back again with the catchment scientist and advisor. In the background, when I am visiting farms, 
Philip is working away in the background, gathering data all the time, and he's generating referrals off the back of that so that I can more target my, my um, I suppose, my work so that I'm not wasting the farmer's time. If there's not an issue in an area, there's no need for me to be there. I only need to focus on the areas that, that there's an issue. So that's the target approach. And I suppose I have box clever down here. And what I mean by that is I mentioned uh, there's, there's two types of advisors. We have Chagas advisors, 20 with about 10 of the co-op advisors with their sustainable Ireland. Um, so there's only 30 of us across the country. So if we don't, if we're not smart in how we approach this, this, this um, advice system, uh, you know, we're going to lose time. We're not going to get the impact we need. So that's quite important. So referrals from Philip. I'm not going to go too much into this because Philip has gone into it. But Philip basically just cut kind of two rough referral areas with, with different issues. Um, so Philip would have went through with we that he would have found uh, loads of oxygen. He would have had um, uh, he would looked at some algae in the river, and we would have, we would have brought out to these sites, and he would have told me what he think might be might be the issues. And I suppose it's up to me to to delve into it a bit deeper. Um, and the main thing to remember is that Philip only goes along the riverbanks. He doesn't walk up farms, so he's only seen a snapshot of it. So it's up to me to try and figure out what's going on further up, further up onto the farms. So we're going to have a look into it there now in a second. Okay, so farmers addressing issues in referral areas. Okay, so for, for just a little bit of level of confidentiality for the farmers, I'm not going to actually um, show you specifically where in the river these points I'm coming across are. Uh, just to be fair to the farmers. Um, okay, so these are the issues. So when Philip gives me a list of referrals, I see them as a list of questions that I need to answer. So when I get onto the farms, I, I look out for what I think might be impacting. So Philip mentioned in one part of the river, there's nutrient issues. So I looked to see, could I find any point sources or maybe nutrients getting into the river that might be causing an issue. So I did near some of the referral areas that I think were probably the main causes. And once I'd find these, um, I, I would kind of discuss with Philip that I think there are certain issues that are causing a problem and we'd agree or not agree on it. So these are the ones we've kind of agreed on. So you can see here one near one of the points of the river, I found a kind of pretty dirty yard. Um, so there was, it was actually fairly well contained, but there's a couple of blocks in one part of the yard, which were open and in heavy rainfall events, there was definitely a wash down. Um, and even though it was probably 20, 30 meters from the river, there's a quite steep bank heading down to the river. So I was afraid that if that doesn't, wasn't kept, kept clean, that was going to be causing an issue. Another issue I found as well was, I suppose, uh, there was a pipe coming out in straight directly into the river. We didn't know at the time, Philip didn't really spot it, but um, because he couldn't, you, you wouldn't see these things. But when I was just having a chat to the farmer one day, we were looking around and we happened to be up in the yard and he had a kind of a clean water drain at the lowest point of the yard and the whole yard fed into it. Um, and I, I, I'm not a fan of those clean water drains. Sometimes it depends where they are in the yard because potentially if an incident happens, you know, it, it's, and it's piped directly to the water course, it can cause problems. However, this was a, an, a farm that you could eat your dinner off the yard very, very clean. Um, I think what probably just happened here is sometimes if a little bit of dirt got, got fell and it wasn't cleaned quickly enough, and you had some rain, it was just a direct, uh, straight direct access to the river. So that farmer has changed that. Um, so it's not directly to the river anymore. That pipe, it's into an attenuation area, into a forest. So it soaks down through. And the other thing that he's done, he's reconfigured his yard. So he's actually changed. We had a chat. We've changed the way he moves uh, from the silage pit to feed barriers. He's changed. He's moving the cows to reduce the stress in the yard. Um, and he's also actually moved that drain to another part of the yard so that if something happens, it can't, it can't affect it. So massive work there at great expense. Uh, he probably spent in excess of 12, 13,000 to, to do that. So that's massive expense. And not all farmers have that type of money to do that. So credit to him for that. Um, and this one here, uh, there was a big cattle access point that we were worried about this one here. And we thought that was having an impact on a monitoring point. But in actual fact, um, when I actually went out to the farm, it is a dairy farm, but this piece of land is actually mostly silage ground and some heifers. Uh, this, this cattle access point is rarely used. So I wasn't 100% sure that this was going to be the problem. So I actually changed this cattle access point around. It's, it's very awkward to put a bridge in there, would cost in excess of about 60, 70,000. So it's not a runner for farmers. It's just That farmer cannot afford that. So we've actually contained it, fenced it off so that they only move through it when they have to move through it. Um, but 
there was a little trib that Pib or Philip pointed out that might be an issue uh, just beside this. And I did follow it up and I found, and it's only because I chatted the farmer, I couldn't find any issue along, along the drain, no issue at all. And I, I was saying to the farmer, I can't understand, I, can't, I, I don't find an issue here. Um, but there is algae in the river and I can see some issues. So uh, it's only when I talked to the farmer that he was telling me that, yeah, he probably was, was, wasn't maybe uh, spread the slurry a little bit too close to, um, to, the, to, the, to the drain here. And it was probably maybe uh, he got caught one day that the weather kind of came heavier than he thought. So out of that farm visit, we've decided that this land here is not going to be spread with slurry anymore. And we're always going to, even with chemical fertilizer, we're going to come way, way back. So that's, he's just, that field has been ruled out for slurry from for now on. I also found some cattle access points and some land erosion, and this has been planted up actually with willow now. So it's, it's quite nice or it's coming on. This is some other issues that I found as well. So you're, you're probably familiar with this, maybe trucks in the wrong place that's been, that's moved now. Um, some compaction issues as well, uh, people going in at the wrong time. But this is one of the main ones, just, just above a monitoring point, and it was probably one of the ones I wanted sorted out, and it is sorted out now as well. Uh, this doesn't happen anymore. Uh, there's just water coming down the farm roadway, straight onto the road, and there's the monitoring point just down the road from it, so it was, it was getting straight in there, so that, that solved. Uh, that's actually pushed onto land now to attenuate, so it doesn't happen anymore. And other solutions that farmers have come are, are doing in the area as well. I, I, I won't touch on it too long, but uh, we we generally talk to farmers a lot about soils, so free drain soils, heavier soils. So I think it's very important that farmers understand how uh, water moves through soil. So I, I do a lot talking about compaction. I do some little workshops with farmers to talk about, um, I suppose, the type of soil they're dealing with, identify their soil. Uh, due to grass vests that they can figure out if they're compacting their soil, just so they can understand the functions that soil provides and, and then how to ma manage their land uh, accordingly. Buffer zones, a lot of very good riparian margins to be put in in the right locations. There's a guy collecting water, there's a couple of guys collecting water actually. Uh, we put in some nose pumps as well to get animals out of the river. Yeah, I showed you cattle access point area, that's gone. Um, there's some really nice bridges got in at quite, quite a lot of expense as well. Uh, some farmers, like I said, can afford them, some can't. So uh, this was a great bridge put in. Um, and this is, this is not my picture now. This is a picture of one of my colleagues, Emer Conroy down in Cork. It's actually a willow area where rather than, remember that pipe that I spoke to you about a minute ago that was piped directly to a, a river that I got them to pipe it over the land into a forest. But so, some, some farms don't have that forest. So, some farmers are actually, and I have a number of clients that have done this, it just hasn't established yet because it's only new, um, cut little areas of the farm off, uh, planted with willow, and they can put some water in top here to attenuate down and the willow can take up the nutrients. So it's just to take that pressure rather than putting that, that gray water directly into a drain where it can hit the river. So that's quite, quite important. Actually, sorry, one thing I forgot to say to you, there's a few farmers with constructed wetlands up in the, in the PA as well. Uh, I haven't done anything there yet with them, but I am working with farmers and some other PAs I'm working at the moment where there was uh, wetlands put in 20 years ago and I'm working closely with Rory Harrington uh, coming up with a plan on rejuvenating these wetlands, but they're very, very expensive to get them to, I suppose, the required standard that they have planning permission and that Waterford County Council is happy that they can be tested and have a discharge license. So but we're working very closely. Waterford County Council, Paul Carr is very supportive if they're run, done right and Rory Harrington is working quite well with me. So I hope to roll out some of this kind of work in the next catchment. But again, uh, funding would, would be very, very good because the farmer that's doing this one for me, it's costing them 20 to 25,000 and that's, it's very expensive. So we need support there. This is just a picture for roadway. A lot of roadway work, work has been done. Look, I know the new roadway regulations has come in in the 1st of January but a lot of farmers needed a lot of help with this. And, and we, we do this kind of work regularly. Uh, lovely bridge again, put in by a farmer. Again, you're talking five, 6,000 euro, put that bridge in. I talk a lot of farmers. This is another lovely novel, um, I suppose, kind of a sediment trap that a farmer innovated himself. So big uh, bales of, of straw, the water's coming down this way. We have actually one here, just a net to catch. And there's one at the back here, you can't see it. And some bales in between. It looks a bit rough and ready, but it actually does a great job. He cleans this out on this side, um, maybe once, twice a year, depending on the sediment build up. Uh, it's actually uh, doing a great job. There's, there's very little sediment getting through. Rough and ready, but it works really well. 
Uh, two pictures here. I can't claim credit for this one. This is the Devon Wildlife Trust project. I show this to farmers a lot because uh, this is a little project to carry out to put up this, this bit of a sediment trap. It's quite big hill, but it, it's on a, a cereals, a winter cereals field. But I often compare it to a uh, grassland, a reseed late maybe into September because what happens, I just want to show this was put in in about October. And this is in end of January at the moment. And you can see how much sediment was actually caught coming down the hill over time. And if you look where the farmers are walking, you actually don't see much sediment. So it's just an indication of, you know, what sediment can run over land down into water. Um, and I always compare it then to, to uh, I suppose, poaching and receding. If, if you are carrying out that kind of practice, um, you know, it's going to lose sediment to water. So it's important for farmers to understand and see this. Uh, just one thing I want to show you, this is um, just to note here, this is uh, an example, it's not the Claude PA because again, protecting farmer confidentiality, but this is the kind of plan that I would give to farmers. I'll go through, I'll, I'll go through the land when army started the river, we'll, we'll work our way back up the land, look at open drains, that kind of stuff. And any issues I'll see, we'll write down, we'll discuss and we'll make agreements on what the farmer will, will try and achieve and, and what that it can't achieve. Uh, and I'll develop a list of actions off the back of it as well. So here, just to give you a quick example, there's a, a roadway running to a drain here. There's a small level of land here with drains either side, so we're not spreading the slurry there at all. It's too dangerous. Uh, there's a bit of slopes off tillage field here, so he's going to cover crop, and he's cutting a big riparian margin out here. I asked him for at least three metres. He's given me five to six metres uh, that should do the job. So it's that kind of detail we're getting into, make sure we catch every point. And one last thing, if we look at the EPA um, overland flow and delivery point maps, which Jenny Deacon uh, demonstrated here before on this, um, it shows a lot of water coming down to this point. And when I actually walked the farm, it, it was shown through to that as well. So we're putting in uh, actually a, a little forestry here in that corner to try and mop it up. So I suppose, the big thing, we'll wrap it up now soon, but I visited up on 45 farms in this in this catchment. Uh, I've given 45 farm assessments. So that's 45 specific farm plans to farmers to work on with, with points and actions that, that they can work on. All the issues uh, found relating to referrals are, are addressed that Philip mentioned. I got 93% engagement. So most of the farmers in that area accepted me onto the farm and were really, really supportive of the program. Uh, Altogether, total risks between all my visits, 45 assessments, I identified 330. Um, I'm probably very fussy uh, in the fact that I identify a lot of risks, but uh, generally per farm, it's coming up an average of eight, eight, roughly eight risks per farm. But um, I fine tune it down just to sediment. I kind of tick off risks as I go along, but I fine tune it just down to sediment. And generally, I would only advise in three or four risks per farm in that letter. I won't put eight down because it's too much. And... If the risk is not a high risk, I won't put it down. We categorize our risks into a category one, two, and three, high, moderate, low. I only advise on the high risks. Um, and only if you can break that mo down more, if it's just sediment risks, that's a lower number again. Uh, I would advise on the, the heavier stocked farms in this area because with the PIP nitrate maps, some of the areas are, are susceptible to nitrate loss. And even though it's not the main issue in the area, if I think there's a high stocking rate and a farmer needs some nitrogen advice, I'll give it to him as well. So 91% of the actions that I ask farmers are agreed, 10% not agreed, and all 10 of those is down to cost, uh, bridges, uh, concrete, just uh, sheds, storage, that kind of stuff that's very expensive. And last then, just to, to wrap it up, I just want to show some other good additional work that's been done in the area as well. Um, we, we put out a, a newsletter as well, just to keep farmers up to date. It's not just a once-off visit. I visit some of these farms three, four times, um, and it's not a once-off visit. We keep in constant update with them. Um, you can see Andrew Gary down here, just to give, he's my counterpart that works with me. He's with Glombia. We work together as asset advisors in the areas, and we work quite tightly as well together. Um, as Andrew does a lot of dairy farms. Um, and then I just want to say, because over the last number of years that people are talking about a lot of water quality in the area, a lot of good work has gone on. One of my farmers has actually become involved in citizen science and has actually taken water samples uh, on the shore project, which is really positive. And um, we also have set up uh, through Anne Phelan, community officer there at the local authorities water program that works with, with Philip. She set up the Friends of the Claudia, which, I've, which I was involved helping her out a little bit, but Anne done all the work really. 
um, and Paul Carroll helped her as well, which is with Waterford County Council. So that's uh, to protect the freshwater pearl mussels that, that are down further downstream to, to Claudia. And also Paul Carroll as well has a freshwater pearl mussel project. So where he's taken some of the pearl mussels, which are dying out in the river, they're not reproducing, taking them into a facility. He's reproducing them in the facility in the hope of putting them back into the river in a safer point uh, so that they're protected. Because we know the freshwater pearl mussels are under severe pressure in, in this side of the country. So great work going on in the area. And I suppose the last thing I'll say to you is working to, together towards a common goal is vitally important. Uh, the scientist, the advisor, and most importantly, the farmer, because we can talk all day long, but the farmer is the key. They're, they're the key to the solution. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Cahill, and thank you, Philip, for two really excellent presentations and a superb example of collaboration between uh, the public advisory services, uh, uh, industry, and, and of course, farmers, and, and that bringing that science and practice together. So uh, congratulations on, on, on a really good work. And and, and there are, you know, obvious, there, there, there's, there's results uh, coming through from that straight away. Um, in terms of the supports, uh, Cottle, uh, that are, are there any supports available or financial support available to farmers to complete the, the, the works if, if there are any issues identified on, on those farms? Yeah, like Mark, there is, there is some supports out there and I won't say there's not TAMS is there that's available to farmers, but um, you get grants, but that, that's some farmers in the last 10 years have, I suppose, um, they've changed their systems. So we, over the last 10 years, we've been looking to produce a little bit more and farmers invest in different things like parlors and storage. And some of them are maxed out in their grants, maybe, and they're heavily invested. Um, but the other issue there is grants are great, but grants are not 100%. So you have to pay a certain percentage. And some farmers just don't have the money. Um, lots of farmers are in different circumstances. Uh, I have farmers ranging from mid 20s up to mid 80s. Uh, some are willing to invest, some will never ever get a loan, they mightn't have the money available. So yes, there is some support available, but I'll be honest with you, Mark, it's not, it's not enough. There's like even this year alone, take for example, I know it's identified that storage is a critical problem. To get an overground tank with a cover on it's going to cost you up to 70, 80,000 euro. That's a massive amount of money for a farmer just to increase their storage. And I know they need it. If they don't have sufficient storage, they need it. If you go to an underground tank, you can add a, a, a way extra on top of that. If you think of just concrete in yards, you're into tens of thousands of euro. If there's a silage slab broken, it's thousands of euro again. If you're into bridges, I have one client that's I'm going down to tomorrow, actually, that's trying to put in a bridge for 80,000 euro. Uh, that's that's huge money. There's no grant available from there. Roadways have one client that spent thirty or sorry twenty two thousand euro on on resloping his roadway. So the money is massive. There is some support there, but we're a long way off. We need more. We need more. Mm -hmm. A question coming in here from a farmer um, about the the comment you made about that farmer who decided not to spread slurry on a, a field alongside the drain. Uh, he says it's a major decision. Surely there is no need to and uh, to do this and, and did you provide an, any alternative advice uh, so basically saying that uh, it, it's, it's quite a, a big decision to, 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 to not, not to be spreading stories uh, on that particular field yeah look at that's a really good point because we're, we're up to farmers to utilize their slurry better to try and replace chemical fertilizer and, and that's that's a key point to make first but secondly you know i i only make a suggestion and advice and, and the farm with me and the farm will have a right discussion about it sometimes they'll say yes sometimes they say no to me we'll we'll, we'll debate it out but um when we when we walk that field uh, it's quite a steep field uh, and it, it goes straight down to the river and the farmer kind of said look to, to be honest with you um, I'm not that fond of spreading slurry there anyway because it's a little bit sloped and he was happy enough that he can still get in there with chemical fertil fertilizer and top up his P's and K's and that that risk of that overland flow is not quite as severe so he's yes he, he won't be spreading slurry there but he, he still doesn't he's not sacrificing his nutrients so we can still put in chemical there as well so it's just just kind of getting the job done in a safer manner but uh, no it's a, it's a very good it's a valid point. Uh, Philip, if I could ask you a question there in relation to the, the non-agricultural sources of pollution, this is a common question we get. How, how do we uh, differentiate and, and, uh, from, from the, the, the other types of pressures that we would see, for example, uh, septic tanks or, or, or those types of sources uh, from, from agricultural sources? 
Yeah, so agriculture is only one of 12 pressures that we actually look at. And as Kyle said, it, it, it's, I spent a nice bit of time trying to untangle those pressures in a water body. Um, so our first, I suppose, level of targeting is that EPA um, initial assessment of the pressures in the area. So they may have information on wastewater treatment plants, um, the forestry, other pressures, we even have a, a layer for septic tank pressure as well. So when we get out and if we do see impacts, we won't, you know, we'll do as much assessment as possible to rule in or rule out other pressures before we get to any specific one. Um, it's, it really is about untangling and trying to narrow down the, um, the, I suppose, the stretch of river that's impacted by specific sources. So we do spend a nice bit of time trying to um, untangle each of them. Um, it wouldn't always be, I suppose the catchment I showed today is, to, is predominantly agricultural. So in that way, we, when we forestry ruled out, the only other pressure in the area would be agriculture. And could you remind us why these particular uh, catchments have been chosen? Uh, why, what, what, are, what are the criteria in broad terms uh, that are used to select them? Well, the priority areas for action are, are picked because they've either, they've been picked by public engagement and agency engagement initially. Uh, I think that was facilitated, facilitated by the EPA and the initial, the law pro um, side of the house too, the community water officers. And that was a way of gathering information on um, what, what water quality data was there to determine what the pressures were. Uh, it could be over time, they look at historical information and um, new pressures, that kind of stuff as well. So it would have been a big public engagement approach to, to end up with the pressures that were there, those initial pressures. Uh, Pat, uh, some really good questions coming through. Yeah. Before, before we go to the questions, just I think it's important that we acknowledge that uh, you have been instrumental in uh, this this asset program uh, coming to coming to life for yourself and, and colleagues, and and I know bringing together industry. So uh, we might we might throw some questions your direction later on. That's fine. That's fine. I know, and and I suppose it's it's the culmination of a lot of work by a lot of people recognizing that. Uh, the, I suppose the approach of, of pure regulation wasn't going to, to meet uh, the, the needs of, of uh, improving water quality. And, and a lot of people began to recognize that this approach could work. Uh, and a lot of people went out on a limb to, to, to set it up. So a lot, a lot of thanks to a lot of people is, is needed in relation to that. Uh, just I suppose one comment, uh, it's a little unusual. So, the presentations were described as very cool. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> and, and that. interesting. Uh, the, a couple of specific questions. There's one, uh, uh, Carl, you, you talk a bit about uh, reed beds, and there's a question there is how important do you, you feel that reed bed uh, filtration of farmyard runoff uh, could be uh, in uh, an Irish context? And what scope is there for, uh, I suppose, scaling down of some of the, the planning to make them uh, practical at farm level? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of reed beds, Pat, or I, I won't call them reed beds. That's the 20 year old term, I suppose. We call them our integrated constructed wet, wetlands, Rory Harrington would kill me if I call them a reed bed. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of them on two fronts, uh, from, I suppose, the advisory front, front and the, the science front. It can clean water first. Um, now, the other issue that farmers really like them as well is because they solve a big problem. Because we, we, you heard from Jack last week about the, the grey water problem, the soil water problem, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think they can be a big solution for us. I think um, the issue with them was that many of them were put in 20, 20 plus years ago, maybe weren't maintained correctly. So I think if we are going down the route and we are in Waterford, I have big support from Waterford County Council. They're, they're very fond of them. And Rory obviously has been involved in the Dunhill project. Um, but what needs to be done to get them to work correctly, number one, they need some funding, they need some support. But number two, most important is we need to get planning permission for them. We need to make sure that they have um, analysis done off them maybe once, twice a year on the outlets to make sure they're working. We need uh, discharge licenses. We, make, we need a proper maintenance on them as well and proper companies supporting farmers to put them in rather than a farmer going out with a plan and trying to design them themselves. I think if we go down that route, I think it'll be very well. It'll work very well and it'll solve problems for farmers and, and myself. At the moment, I just tell you, Pat, I have probably, I have one farmer doing one at the moment that's rejuvenated. I have five other farmers that are, are interested in it as well. I have, I have one guy that spent significant amount of money on, um, I suppose, a system, an irrigation system to spread water on land. Um, 
but he's going to ditch all that now for for the constructed wetlands because he's not a fan of putting dirty water out. Um, his land is quite heavy, so he doesn't look, like to put it out, I suppose, at the wrong time. So the constructed wetlands are cleaning that water for him. Okay, a, a question, a, a kind of a broad uh, question, Carl. You showed uh, some good examples of, of mitigation solutions, but in general, uh, what have you found to be the greatest barriers to get in the right measures in the right place to complete a stage? Uh, and how do you think these barriers could be overcome? Yeah, there's a couple of barriers. Uh, like money is a big one, Pat. It is a big one, but we've spoke about that, so I'll skip that. Two is land as well. Like if you're looking for someone to put in, we're talking about sediment loss, overland flow. So when you're talking about that, we have to break the pathway. Um, so when you break pathways, you have to put a barrier in place. So it'd be sediment traps, uh, which can be tricky to, to put in and install uh, or put in actual physical barriers like forestry, which some farmers are a little bit afraid to do because once it's in, it's in for life. Um, so what I find a lot of farmers are, are, are liking are these kind of willow systems where you know you can put them in and take them out. But the big barrier, I suppose, I would hear a lot as well that some farmers are waiting for to see what's coming out of cap. That, um, you know, I, I might suggest something that might say, well, maybe we'll get paid for the cap and they're kind of holding off a bit. So I often think if we had something that we could give them to help them support them, that would have the job done now rather than waiting for support come two, three years down the line. Because uh, I've, in my head, it, it's a little bit of a race against time, against the clock. I have 20, 27 in my mind to get all our water bodies up to good status. I don't think we can wait two or three years for that support to come. I think it needs to come now. Um, and, and they are the main barriers, to be honest with you. The farmers are not barriers at all. Like um, I probably suggested before that I go out and I give advice, but I don't have all the answers. When I hit a farm, the farmer knows their land better than I do. And we work together. And some farmers have given me massively good ideas that I bring to other farmers. So that there's a really good um, connection between me and the farmer and all the advisors like that as well. So... I think um, just I think the farmer needs to commend it for some of the stuff that they're, they're really good innovators and, and great engineers as well. So I okay. think it's not the farmer necessarily is the issue. I think it's just that some of the steps can be tricky to get around. Question for Philip. Uh, Carl, you've been doing all the talking. Uh, have you a timeline for completion work on a, a catchment and how do you decide when your role is finished and, and what is the, the, the closeout process? Yeah, it's um, it varies depending on the area for action that we're working in. Uh, because I actually only showed you a single water body area for action. I have another one that has twelve separate sections, and so it's hard to put a, a specific time on it. But if you're to work in a, a water body section, like we'd be aiming to have it, you know, within within a two year process. It depends on measures, depends on assessments that are there, um, and it depends on I suppose that that feedback and the targeting and untangling that's there. So it is hard to put a, a real timeline on it in terms of how we do it then if just in terms of agriculture here at least it'll take a lot of conversations between me and Cahill in terms of what measures have been implemented and are they enough to um, eliminate that evidence of impact that I would have saw at the river um, for other pressures then forestry and that we may you know expect to see agreements on what will be done before a felling event or pre or post um, wastewater treatment plants may have licenses or, or that that need to be addressed to make sure that these charges are, are addressed at a certain time so uh, it can vary but there's um, you know there's a I suppose a, a lot of engagement required to get something completely closed out in a catchment especially with so many pressures that can be there. The yeah, questions I'm coming sure. in there sorry Pat just in, okay. re in relation to the, the broader because we just should be emphasized that we're just talking about one particular catchment uh, today our priority action area and um, maybe Philip you could could you Tell us just a little bit what's happening at a, a national scene in terms of uh, the catchment science, if I'm not putting you in an awkward position there, but I, I, so some people uh, aren't aware that this is an, an actual, a national program and there are catchment scientists and agricultural scientists operating across the country. Yeah, I suppose the next thing that's happening with terms that we like, we've initially 190 areas for action, but we have a new river basin management plan coming out soon, which will uh, identify a, a new number of areas for action nationally again for our next cycle, which will be another three years, I think it is. Uh, so this will be rolled out again. There will be some public consultation coming up to have an input on that. Um, and so we'll this work is actually going to be expanded, I suppose, in the next number of years again uh, and nationally. And like I said, we're nationally focused, but we're regionally based. So I'm only talking about the Southeast region here at the moment, but this is, this is uh, across all Ireland. 
Okay, thanks, Pat. The question there in relation to the continuity of the programs, uh, when are the programs finishing or are they going to be continued? So we're at the end of this cycle uh, at this year, 2021, and we're going into a new cycle then for, um, it's in agreement that we'll be going into another two cycles, I think, for until 2027. Uh, and in, I can kind of give in relation to, to the ASAP, there is a review uh, imminent and, and uh, arising after that, there will be a decision on the continuation of the ASAP program. Um, so in, uh, I suppose a question there, in relation to, I suppose you, you talked a good bit about phosphorus, but what uh, measures are potential, or do you potentially take with farmers where nitrates are, are deemed to be the problem? Yeah, sure, I'll take that one, Philip. Yeah, Pat, um, nitrate, like, look, we know nitrate in the Southeast is, is a difficult problem. Like I said, the PIP maps identified there are certain areas in, in that, in, in, I suppose, the Claudia that are susceptible to it. It's not coming up in the river, at the moment, but downstream from it is, there's this in another river or trip, there's a significant issue down there. So look, the measures that I'm talking about is, there's a couple of things on it, but I focus generally on the right time anyway, and generally on the shoulders of the year is a big one for me, uh, early nitrogen and also late as well. The, I suppose what David Wall always says, and I think it's a really good point is, that sometimes we worry during the year and, and unnecessarily sometimes we don't need to worry about during the year because it's the height of the growing season so what i tried to tell farmers is we need to link uh, our nitrogen applications to our growth so that's why i'm a big fan of grass measuring because you can physically measure um what what growth and what i often say to a farmer is um you, you one farmer you could be spreading whatever 200 kilograms per hectare on your farm and you could be growing 12 tons of grass uh, per year but the, the neighbor next door could be spreading the same nitrogen and maybe growing six tons so we have to i suppose adapt to our systems um i often look at the p's and k's as well and lime is a massive one for me um lime has actually improved considerably in the three years or the last three years i see significant differences improvements and the p's and k's as well we're, we're looking I, I only look for p's and k's to come up to index trees if it's a kind of a heavier stock farm um, but the lower stock farms, like for look, it's crazy looking for them to go up to index index three. So uh, that's kind of stuff. They're at the right place as well. But I think the big one we kind of look over a bit, and we, we haven't talked about enough for the years is clover. I think we have to reduce our chemical inputs, uh, and I think clover has to be a massive part of that. And I see a big shift lately, and I, I'm a big fan of multi species multi species swards as well coming in. So I think they're they're some of the future to reduce our chemical inputs. I was on a farm yesterday with, with very good clover and very good multi-species swards in one of my other PAs, and they're actually spreading half their nitrogen uh, compared to the rest of the grassland. And then visit another farmer next week who's actually skipped uh, four or five rounds of nitrogen this year as well. So there is a shift there, but but we need to help them. And the last thing I, I won't hold you up too long is the soil type. I keep coming back to I suppose my background is a little bit soilsy, so I, I'm a big fan of soil type, but um, we can't just tell a farmer what to do. We need to let, get them to understand about soils and how nitrogen moves through soils. Um, and it's not just as basic as heavier versus light soils. We, we have to give them the credit to, to allow them to understand it. And once they understand that, that, that makes uh, things a lot easier. Now, I could give you a list of other things we can go into, but that's just a taste for it. Better not. Yeah. I think, I think uh, the, the boss will, 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 will uh, cut us fairly shortly. Trap door will open soon. <laughs> it's not the okay. first time. <laughs> Look, thank you so much, uh, Philip uh, Murphy from Law Pro and Carl Summers from the, the ASA program. Really enjoy those presentations and really positive feedback coming through from our viewers today. And Pat, thanks so much for helping with the, que uh, the, the questions this afternoon. And uh, just a great example of a, of a project, again, collaboration between industry farmers and, and uh, the advisory services and the scientists as well. So. Uh, Hopefully, we'll, we'll be in a position in, in a couple of years' time to report uh, the, the positive impacts of, of the project. Because, of course, these things take time, don't they, to, to have an impact on, on water quality. So I suppose we do have to be patient from that point of perspective. So in next week, we're going to be joined by Dr. Patrick uh, Crushell, who's a project manager with the, Cur the Pearl Muscle Project. And he's going to be talking to us about a results-based payment scheme uh, that uh, is being designed to target endangered species these endangered species so really looking forward to, to patrick's presentation next friday so with that we just want to say thanks to our production team andy boland and yvonne maher is helping in the background today 
Pat, thanks for the, with the questions today again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week at 9.30. So we shall talk to you then. Thank you.